Hey, what's up, Leron here. And in this video, I'm going to show you how to create and express texture in watercolor. So I'm finally addressing this question I've been asked so many times, okay? And you're going to see the principles that lead up to a good impression uh, in a way I enjoy doing it. Now, before we get to it, if you enjoy my videos, I would really appreciate if you drop a like and maybe a comment and maybe even share this video with someone you know will find it useful. I really appreciate it and it helps me reach and help more people. With that, let's get started. Okay, so I'm starting with the drawing. Now we are gonna jump through this stage uh, rather fast, but I do want to touch upon a couple of things. One of the main things I'm looking for when drawing this, and notice how I'm totally freehanding it. I'm not really measuring too much. Uh, the thing I'm looking at is a lot of the time negative shapes. What shape does the ear and the neck of the French bulldog create with the left side of the paper? What shape, you know, don't just look at the shape of the ear, look at the shape of the space around it. That can really help you just notice the proportions, read them more accurately. Uh, I'm not Notice also how I started from around the face and then slowly worked my way in uh, towards the details. Okay, first get the whole structure going and then uh, get the finer details. And of course, I'm not 100% accurate. When you don't measure, you will be inaccurate. And sometimes when you measure, you will also be uh, inaccurate. That's just a part of it. But try looking for relations and what's called pipelines. Look at the eye and find out what other elements it intersects with. Once you get the eye in, then use that to find out what elements intersect with that. For example, horizontally or vertically, how the shape of the shadow uh, interacts with the shape of the, you know, the shadow on the cheek and the shadow on the eye, the distance between them, the angle between them. Uh, now I am going to put down below um, the, the reference photo and also in the description box and also the drawing stage, the finished drawing stage, okay, um, in a more high quality picture. So you can use it, just use it as it is. You don't necessarily have to redraw it yourself. You can, I don't know, trace it or use it in whichever way you'll find uh, useful. So I hope that's uh, going to be a good solution. Now on to the painting stage. So initially, I'm starting here with the dark shapes. So you can see here, I'm just starting with where I can see it's really fully black. Now then with time, I'm going to move more towards um, areas that are mid value and when I want to get a gradual transition I'll, I'll try and get that but for the most part with these kinds of very clear light and shadow areas you can really just start from the darkest sections and then you just get a better idea of your uh, range of values you get the you know value how dark or light a color is so in this example white is the lightest black is the darkest and everything in the middle B by putting in first the darks you establish the full range of values and many times this is something a lot of people have trouble with should i start light to dark should i should i go dark to light should i go from the middle um it's very it can seem very tricky in watercolor because and by the way now you see me move into mid values it can be tricky in watercolor because um you can't really go back you can't paint light over dark that's impossible really it is with thick paint as you may know but it's just not the best way of doing it um so you have to have a process that's more streamlined because once you're done with your darks, you're pretty much done. So a lot of people are scared of starting with the darks, but you don't actually have to be. Um, you can paint the darks first and then paint the mid values between them. You don't you can wait for them to dry and then paint the mid values. You don't even have to, you know, no one's forcing you to have all of the painting in one perfectly even wash you know like I show I've shown you recently how I pre-wet everything do most of the painting wet and wet no one forces you to work that way you can just work in sections and if the painting has white spaces like this one has quite a lot of you know very light areas some of them are perfectly almost perfectly white others I interpret as white to make things easier for myself if a painting has a lot of these areas, you can use them as kind of resting spots. You know you're not touching them, you know you don't have to worry about them, you just paint around them. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Now what you see me do is effectively trying to, if I'm already in a section where a lot of the shadows touch, I'm trying to preserve that flow, okay? So if I can merge the shapes together, I will. I won't necessarily, you know, uh, bend over backward to get it perfectly merged together, but if I can, I will. So what you see me do is first put that dark, very dark wash, okay? It's not black. It may seem black also in the, in the video, but it's actually not. It's a little lighter. And then what I'm going to do 
into that is use a bit more water, dilute the mix, and come back and create the shadow, the areas around it that aren't as dark, you see? And then the two washes mix and we get a better flow. But notice how there are a lot of many small shapes around there that I don't, I'm not necessarily too concerned about. So I'm trying to merge what's possible and not worry too much about what isn't possible or what's very challenging. Sometimes things are possible, but it's just, you know, you gotta pick your battles and if something is so hard and you can just ignore it. Now, a couple of words about texture because this is gonna be a main part of this video. My um, argument is that the texture can be understood by three main ways. One way is the values. I know it's funny, but that's just how it is. And, and I'm gonna explain. Second is the actual thing you're painting. So if I'm painting a dog, you immediately understand that the dog has fur. So you don't need me to actually draw every strand of hair. You can, if that's the style you're aiming for, but you don't have to do it for the viewer to understand, okay? Um, so that's the second thing, what the object you're painting actually is. And that actually connects with the first, values, because values are the thing that tells the story of what it is. Now, third is edges. When you look at the shapes uh, I'm painting, their edges really hint at the texture. Just look at the dog, okay? Look at the shadow on, on its cheek, the cheek that's closest to us. You get this, you know, the gray large shadow, and the edges of it, you can see the hair kind of moving into that shape and creating these sharp highlights, okay? So that's one way of conveying for, uh, or any texture for that matter, the edges of the shapes. And notice how I'm not even putting that much emphasis on the edges, okay? I'm more about getting the values down and, you know, getting them mostly in an accurate manner. They're not gonna be perfect, but they're gonna be pretty darn close. So I'm, I'm not even worried about that yet. Um, another thing you can do, which I, by the way, forgot here, but I could definitely have taken advantage of, is using like the white gel pen I used to get all these sharp uh, different uh, highlights, you know, the mustache, the hairs of the dog and the, and the nose, uh, the whiskers, what you'd call them, um, which I totally forgot and should have done, but I don't know, sometimes that happens. When I'm filming, you know, it's easier to forget. I think if I just painted this for myself, I'd probably remember, because when I started with the process, I told myself I will do that. Uh, but in any case, you could use a white pen to get all the whiskers, get all the small uh, hair or fur texture, uh, so you can not only paint the shape of hairs by putting dark color, you can also bring it back by using light color over dark, if you're using something that allows you to paint opaquely, okay? Uh, that's, again, the whole challenge with watercolor, unlike oils and acrylics and gouache, where you can go back with light and bring back the, this texture, uh, but I actually love this about watercolor because it saves you from falling into the trap of you know going too detailed, going too much. If you can keep correcting and layering more and more and more, then when do you stop? You know when? How do you know you can stop and you're happy with the results? So watercolor really teaches you spontaneity. Okay. Now notice how slow I'm going in this section. The eye. That's where a lot of things are going on, and I just want to make sure I get all those small highlights and details. A big feature of, of dogs in general, animals, people is eyes. And especially with when you get these, you know, French bulldogs, Frenchies that are so cute, their eyes are really big, kind of like aliens, uh, kind of like pug dogs, same thing going on there. Uh, you really want to make sure that you get that at least right. Now, notice how I'm getting a texture also using the paper's texture. I'm creating this sense of maybe it's fur, maybe it's something else, but it's kind of a ragged texture by just leaving some dry brush marks on the paper. That's another thing that can really help to get that. So let's just conclude what I said about textures. You have three main ways, I think, of doing it. First is the values and the shapes, obviously. Second is uh, the actual thing you're painting. People will understand based on that uh, what the texture is. And third, uh, and a good example of that, by the way, is if you paint grass, you know, from afar in a landscape, no one questions it. It's green, it's a part of a landscape, people understand. And third would be edges of shapes. Okay, so if you have the shape, its edges can really describe and tell the story of the material it's used, it's made from. So I hope that makes sense. Now we're pretty, uh, adva we're pretty quickly uh, advancing here with the process. So I'm j I just got that main section of the nose. I, that's part. That part's so cute. Um, and and once we get that in, 
we're pretty much done with the large, more challenging sh shapes. What it's all about now is getting the smaller nuances within that uh, to make the shape more believable, the overall shapes more believable, uh, and perhaps getting a background. A background will also help us um, m give more meaning to the actual highlights you see here. Um, because once you, you know, all the paper white on the dog's face, it's not really visible because we have, we, the background's also white. So as you always know, once you add a dark background, it really puts things into a new context. Now here's my attempt to do try and include some uh, some of the furry texture here and there. It's not something I really enjoy and I kind of thought I'd give it a try, but it's not necessarily my way of doing it. Um, I'm really all for getting the values right. Um, and perhaps, you know, using some opaque paint to bring back the hair strands. That's fine. I think that's a good way of doing things. Um, you'll actually see me later go back and just uh, re-darken some spots that will make more sense. Now, when you're practicing texture, I would say a big challenge is, you know, getting the actual texture um, and, and getting its shape right. So I would eliminate some challenge. Uh, for me personally here, that's eliminating color. I don't want to mess with color when I'm so concerned with the shapes um, and their edges and the values. I want to be able to isolate just one particular thing. Uh, so this is why I eliminated color from here and I'm using a black and white reference. Another thing I eliminated here is gradual transitions. There aren't many too gradual of transitions. If you want to see a really gradual transition, if anything, it's the background. Look at the top areas. It's kind of a vignette style, you know, the top, the corners are a little darker in a circular motion towards the center, it gets lighter. That's a gradual transition. The dog's face itself is pretty harsh lines and harsh transitions. Um, so that's another element that uh, that eliminating will help you, uh, you know, just getting an easier result. Now, let's say you want to, it's very interesting, let's say you want to focus on or practice color and using colors in the right way. How would I go about simplifying in that case? I would use a simpler, um, probably a simpler uh, reference and simpler values in particular. If you want to focus on color, go simpler on the on the values, you know, because you're not focusing on the values. Uh, so take, for example, this picture, just turn it into black and white. Just have areas that are black, areas that are white. Forget about, disregard the gray. You don't need the gray if you're going to practice color. It's kind of like the flutist video I did and a bunch of other videos where I kind of divided this the reference or the subject into two values only. And that allows me to focus on color, maybe on temperature, you know, make it easy on yourself. That's what I'm big on. You will know when you can make it harder on yourself. Trust me, you'll feel like you're plateauing. You'll know how to do that. But uh, many times you need to go easier on yourself. I see a lot of people that tackle these super complicated uh, references that they're just frankly not prepared to. Now, I'm never against challenging yourself. By the way, look at this. This darkening, this section is going to be very, very important to bring out the uh, wide of the eye. But in any case, I'm and I'm going to darken it more in a second. In any case, I just want to emphasize, I'm always for challenging yourself. I'll never tell you not to. I do think there is an argument to be made uh, for being gradual, not being too hard on yourself. If you're too hard on yourself, you're more likely to lose motivation. You're too, you're more likely to fail. Um, finding out, the, and, and you know, you will never know your limits un unless you test them. So, test them if you feel like um, that's a thing that will help. Uh, but once you do, you figure them out, you can take a few steps back and then find your balance, you know. So yeah, everyone finds their own way. Uh, that's just my way of doing it. No, don't, don't take it literally and find what works best for you. And here you saw me add just a bit of more texture, a bit of hairs here and there, just near the edges of the shapes to indicate that, you know, there's the, it's fur, it's hair. Um, and yeah, now it's all about finishing touches. I noticed that I missed some mid values, which is very a very common mistake for me. That happens all the time. And initially, I actually wanted to tackle this fully wet and wet, uh, but I decided not to do that. Um, just to, to be able to render the shapes and focus on the texture of the face, okay? So now we're adding this background I was talking about that I said would be really meaningful. One fun part about doing monochromatic is you don't have to take too long of mixing. Uh, and so you don't have to start mixing, you know, more blue, I need more red, I need more yellow, you just go for it. And that's really good for 
uh, being quick, especially with larger shapes, the, the large dark background. Notice how I switch to a larger brush. You don't have to torture yourself and you don't have to force yourself to work super duper duper quickly. You know, that can just be a burden on you. And we want to get the shape right. We want to get, you know, the borders of the face right. So we don't need to add uh, unnecessary challenges here. Here I messed it up. I'm going to take just a piece of toilet paper and dab it. Mistakes happen. Uh, I need to leave a white gap next to the uh, you know, the edge of the ear. So here we go, fixed it. Uh, my background wash isn't as even as I'd want it to be, but you still see how it's not really affecting the overall impression. In fact, it really enhances it, okay? Um, what else should I say about the background? I don't have the paper at too strong of an angle, but just a bit of an angle. Um, just to get some of it moving downwards, okay? Otherwise, I find it a little hard to get these washes, and I'm not even painting a large size. You can tell uh, I've recently worked on larger pieces. This isn't one of them, so uh, it's even easier, but still not uh, easy enough. Now, notice how, again, I'm very aware of the different sections. For example, I know that I that the left, I was just about to say, and then I painted it. I know that the left section is starting to dry, the right section is starting to dry. So I'm alternating. I'm moving right, left, right, left, and I'm trying to preserve the evenness as much as I can. Now, one more thing I was tempted to do, and I made sure I don't, is to go too dark with the background. I wanted to keep this fairly high key, get the darkest darks on the dog, not in the background. So I really forced myself to avoid going too dark. And that actually means that the area I'm working on right now has a similar value with the background and the dog. You will see in a moment when it dries, it has a similar value. So there isn't a strong differentiation there. And you know what? I'm great with that because we have other areas that really separate the dog's shape and the background. So I don't need all of this shape around the dog to, you know, uh, if anything, I would have benefited more for blending the, the back of the neck of the dog with the background on the left. That would have worked even better. Um, because then you'll have a clearer focal point. That's actually something I want to try at some point. Uh, and I see a lot of uh, very skilled painters do that. Uh, many, I saw a couple of Korean ones and, and like Chen Chung Wei is really good at doing it. All sorts of uh, more uh, from the Far East uh, watercolor painters. They tend to have this massive control of the of the the paint and they're able to merge the, there is one called Misulbu. Um, I, I think I uh, have linked uh, to this artist's YouTube channel a while back. Uh, by the way, darkening the cheek, it should be darker. Uh, but this artist has insane control. Um, and and I'm gonna link down below. I'm gonna remember missile boom. I'm gonna link it down below and I have a 17 minutes mark around that time of the video. I'm gonna write it down for myself um, because it's really worth seeing. It's really worth seeing the control that uh, they have over the, I don't know, just the blending the, the portrait with its background. It's just incredible. Uh, but in case with that, we're done with the process. I'm gonna remove the tape and talk about the painting. So here we go, final result without the tape. I wanted to show you uh, what it looks like with the clean frame. Uh, and as you see, I left quite a lot for uh, imagination, interpretation. When it comes to the actual final details, I find that when you don't go too detailed, uh, our brain is amazing at filling in the details. And notice how just a few suggestions of fur here and there uh, near the edges of shapes is enough to convey that feeling. Some of the dry brush supports that as well, creates this, you know, you know, broken lines that feel perhaps like fur. And our brain interprets what it's looking at. In this case, um, a French bulldog, so it knows that this is fur. And it's just, it's doing an amazing job at filling in the blank. So you don't have to worry too much uh, about the texture. So with that, let's wrap it up face to face. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this one. I hope you like seeing the end result without the border. Uh, and I think this way of approaching things is very healthy for the style I'm after. So I don't really enjoy, you know, painting every small strand of hair with a super tiny brush. I find that often I'll lose sight of the whole picture. And if I can just create that impression, with um, leaving something for the imagination. I find that I enjoy it so much more. And maybe you're in the same camp as I am because uh, I know a lot of you are interested in that kind of a thing. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this one. If you wanna learn how to paint like me, as always, link to my frustration-free watercolor course can be found in the description box below. I just wanna say I'm super grateful for you and for you watching the video. I 
I really, really appreciate it. That's all I'm asking for. If you just watch the video, that's huge for me. Even if you never buy any course or anything like that, I really appreciate that uh, because my goal is to help more people, is to reach more people. And uh, I'm trying to do that with as much free content as possible. I wanna put as, as few paywalls as I can. So once in a while, I'll launch a course and it's gonna be very specialized um, in a specific niche and it's gonna solve a specific problem. But for the most part, you never really have to buy anything. I have hundreds of videos by now. Uh, so be sure to check it out and subscribe if you still aren't. Uh, and don't forget one more thing, one last thing, to hit the bell button. Uh, because that means you'll get notifications for when I post new videos and even that sometimes don't doesn't work uh, But it just makes sure that you will see future uploads. So thank you so much and I will see you again in the next vid real soon